Well, is the law being used against us or is it being used to protect us? Well, the introduction of Bill C-63, the so-called online harms bill, raises that question and that's what we're going to talk about today. A clear path forward requires looking back and learning. Good public policy requires human connection. It's a consideration of the facts, applying common sense and innovation. It's urban, it's rural, it's real life. We all have something to contribute. We all have a responsibility to get informed because there's a little piece of Canada in all of us, isn't there? Let's learn on this path together. This is Leaders on the Frontier. So with me here today is um, our uh, guest, uh, John Carpe. I'm very excited to have John with us. He's the president of the Canadian Centre for Justice. And a warm welcome to you, John. Hey, glad to be with you, David. Well, John, um, you and your team at the Justice Centre must be uh, hard at work more than ever, I know, as you uh, seek to protect uh, the freedom of, of uh, every Canadian across our country, as we see a myriad of bills being introduced that uh, seem on face value to be good things, but we need to really look at the details, don't we, John, in terms of bills such as uh, the so-called uh, on online harms bill. Uh, what's your, your quick take on this, uh, this bill? Well, it's a very clever introduction. Online harms, uh, who, could be, who could be in favor of that? Nobody's in favor of online harm. Uh, protecting children, uh, everybody's in favor of that. And so mm -hmm. when the government introduced this, they, uh, they said this is to protect kids from bullying and to crack down on, on hate speech and terrorism and all manner of evil. And we're here to protect you. And so now we've got a bill that's going to um, really damage free speech in Canada, impose a okay. cold, wet blanket, uh, chilling effect. Uh, Canadians are going to self-censor self -censor to avoid uh, the risk of a uh, $50,000 penalty paid to the federal government or $20,000 penalty uh, paid to um, complainant or both uh, if the Canadian Human Rights Commission, in its subjective view, deems your speech to be, quote, hateful. And uh, mm -hmm. we're going to have criminal code amendments uh, so that people can be placed under house arrest and forced to wear an ankle bracelet Wow! Uh, without having committed a crime based on what they might do in future. We've got new powers to the federal cabinet to censor social media services. We've got a digital safety commission to enforce those new regulations. Uh, we've got life imprisonment for uh, advocating genocide. And um, all of this is uh, duplicates laws that we already have. Uh, just okay, about everything wow. in the Online Harms Act is already okay, uh, so criminal John, code offense. You've, you've really done a brilliant summation of really essentially everything wrong with this Bill C-63. Um, it doesn't sound very good at all. And, and I think this is in complete contrast with what we hear certainly in the mainstream media. And I do want to play a clip about the introduction of this bill because it's, to me as a layperson, um, it's, it's confusing because you hear a lot of good things about, well, even the title is called the online harm protection bill i mean c63 so if we could play that clip let's let's look at what they're saying we begin tonight with a new plan aimed at targeting what is all too often an invisible battlefield of digital danger under the new online harms bill unveiled today five years after it was first promised platforms would have to remove non-consensual sexual content within 24 hours of a complaint being filed or face a maximum fine of $10 million or 6% of global revenues. CTV's Michael Couture on the new measures to take on the trigger of torment impacting lives. Her smile, her laughter and her innocence have all been taken from her. Jane doesn't want to share her full name, but she does want to share her story. Over a two-year span, her toddler daughter was sexually abused by a trusted adult. Countless images and videos were posted online. She asked me one time, she goes, but mom, you can take them down forever, right? And I couldn't respond as a parent. I didn't know what to say. But with this legislation, Jane hopes her daughter's childhood innocence can be restored and those images finally taken off the internet. 
The Online Harms Act proposes sweeping measures for online platforms to prevent and remove seven types of content that sexually victimizes a child or re-victimizes a survivor, is used to bully a child, induces a child to harm themselves, incites violent extremism or terrorism, incites violence, foments hatred, and intimate content communicated without consent. Now, before reading the bill, the opposition Conservatives had warned it would attack freedom of speech, but the minister says that's not what this is about. We are not talking about stuff that some people call awful but lawful. There will still be humiliating comments. Now, the legislation will not apply to private messages on platforms like Snapchat, Discord or WhatsApp, places where non-consensual sexual images are often shared. The NDP supports the bill, but will push for amendments. This bill is too important uh, to be uh, playing around with. We need to make sure that we are getting uh, to the heart of the issue. Jane agrees, and she says this bill gives her and her daughter hope. I would love those images to be gone. Um, yeah, I mean, that is the ultimate. If that could be possible, that would be the best. Now, this new legislation does come with some hefty fines for online platforms that don't comply. Penalties can top $10 million or 6% of the platform's global revenues, whichever is greater. Omar? All right, Mike, thank you for this tonight. Hey, so there you have it. There's a very different message from the one that you just overviewed, John, where the emphasis is on um, trying to protect those poor kids out there online. Um, I, our heart goes out for the, the, the parent that talked about uh, those, those images and, and, and the abuse that they've suffered. Um, surely no one can be, um, you know, obviously advocating uh, ways to protect us from child pornography and uh, revenge pornography, horrible things. So, John, why, why are they leading with that message? Because it seems like there's two bills. There's that bill, but there's the second one. That is very different, and we'll get get into that in a moment, that talks about hate speech. So how do you see this issue, John? All seven of those things that we just saw on the clip are already criminal. It is already a criminal code offense to post uh, revenge porn. It is already a criminal code offense to post uh, an intimate image of somebody without their consent. It is already... It's already in the law, you're saying. Currently, John. it is a criminal code offense also to uh, to threaten somebody is criminal, mm -hmm. uh, to intimidate is criminal. Uh, the willful promotion of hatred, whether it's online or offline, is already criminal. Advocating for genocide is already criminal. Advocating for violence and terrorism is already criminal. Uh, to advocate for the violent overthrow of, of the government, so using non-democratic means, is already a criminal code mm -hmm. offense. It's called sedition. It's illegal. Everything that the government is trotting out is already criminal. And what this bill does, I mean, it, it, certainly it tugs at the heartstrings, right? But it's interesting that the, the media there, who are supposed to be the, the uh, conveyors of, of truth, the bearers of truth, uh, don't even mention the fact that all of these things are already illegal. And if there is an enforcement problem, I don't know, if we need more policing, more resources, then uh, th that might be a, a good topic for a separate discussion. Um, this, this just duplicates what's already there, except it's more than just duplicate, right? And we'll, I'm, I'm sure you'll, we'll get into hmm. that more. Okay. So we know that those components of the bill, the first part of it, if you will, are already there in law. It, it sounds like a duplication, what you're saying, John. So let's talk about the second part, the so-called, um, tools designed to uh, protect people from hate speech online. Um, can you tell us more about that? So currently under the criminal code, section 319 prohibits the uh, willful promotion of hatred and, and public incitement of hatred. And so uh, that is if it's directed against a group based on a listed ground, uh, and that would include uh, race, ethnicity, national origin, mm -hmm. uh, sex, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression. If you willfully promote hatred against a group uh, on, on the basis of one of those enumerated grounds, you're committing criminal code offense. Now, if you promote hatred against a group 
uh, for, for other reasons. If you were to, you know, I don't know, bankers or lawyers or uh, people that didn't get injected with the COVID vaccine, it, you can promote hatred against identifiable groups, but not on the basis of those prohibited grounds of, of race and ethnicity, gender, religion, etc. So if you uh, post on the internet, on your website, uh, if you, you willfully promote hatred against a, a group on the basis of their, their race or their religion, uh, you can be criminally charged and convicted and uh, potentially locked up in jail. That law is there. Uh, we it's not really knowable to what extent does it restrict freedom of speech uh, probably does not have a huge impact because it's very narrow it's very targeted and there are defenses available to the accused such as the defense of truth so okay. if you were to say that there is a particular ethnic group where they had higher rates of uh, crime uh, family violence uh, illiteracy drug abuse and if, if you were charged with willful promotion of hatred for saying that about that ethnic group, then you could avail yourself of the defense of truth. And you could say, okay, but here's the data. But what I said is actually true. This ethnic group does have higher rates of family violence or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. What this bill does, though, is it gives new powers to the Canadian Human Rights Commission to prosecute non-criminal speech that is deemed to be hateful and, and hate, uh, as you and I know, is is very subjective. You and I could w uh, listen to the same podcast, watch the same YouTube mm -hmm. video, and one of us would say it's hateful, and the other one would say, no, it's not hateful, it's just strongly worded opinion. So it's very subjective, and that's where you get this chilling effect where it's going to cause people, uh, it's going to cause Canadians to self-censor. Okay, so just to back up here for a sec, so with the new bill that's being proposed, the second part of it, they're weighing in with the full force of law. They will put you in jail for a lifetime, a life sentence. Is that right, John? Well, the, currently the criminal code prohibits uh, advocating for genocide, genocide being the, the killing of an entire people group. And it's the same listed grounds of race, religion, sexual orientation, etc. So currently, if you advocate for genocide, uh, maximum penalty you could get if you're convicted is five years in jail. This bill would raise that to uh, life imprisonment. So move it up there to being the as bad as murder. Wow. Okay. And then um, you compare that to the maximum penalty for sexually assaulting a minor under the age of 16. Maximum penalty is 14 years in jail uh, compared to a lifetime in jail as maximum penalty for advocating for genocide. And again, that's not plotting or planning or doing anything. That's just simply for saying mm -hmm. that a certain people group wow. ought to be, you know, wiped off okay. the face of the earth. So which John, is give, give an example. What Help us understand this. You're saying that if someone is deemed to be uh, using hate speech or advocating for genocide and, and whatever those terms mean, they could put be put in jail for life. Is that true? If a court, well, let's just take the current conflict in Gaza. So yes, the answer if, is yes. Is that right, John? Yes, that's the maximum penalty. Not to say that you would get the maximum penalty, but the maximum penalty is life in prison if you are convicted of advocating for genocide. Wow. As opposed so to five years defines, currently. So John, who will define under this bill, C63, who defines what hatred is? You know, the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, roughly a decade ago, they released a decision in uh, Saskatchewan Human Rights Tribunal versus Watcott. Uh, Bill Watcott was handing out flyers in, in uh, Saskatchewan, uh, paper flyers, pamphlets, uh, mm -hmm. strongly denouncing uh, gay sex and saying it was unhealthy and, and was also bad for your soul and you know, could lead to mm -hmm. an e eternal damnation. He's handing out these flyers, yeah. which some people found, or maybe a lot of people found very offensive. And mm -hmm. the, in the, this made its way up from the human rights tribunal to the Saskatchewan court of Queens bench court of appeal, Supreme court of Canada. And the Supreme court spent more than 4,000 words uh, in its decision, trying to define hatred. And it's just, it's an emotion. How do you define an emotion? Uh, you know, how do you define joy? I mean, mm. you could take a stab at it, but uh, mm -hmm. to to really know if if something is hate hate speech or not is is pretty difficult. But it gets worse when you you have the criminal code provisions, and hardly anybody gets charged with 
willful promotion of hatred because it's it's very specifically worded. If you also yeah. add on a new layer of law whereby you empower the Canadian Human Rights Commission to go after people, prosecute people, but not criminals. So if you get convicted, mm -hmm. you don't get a criminal record, but you could be out of pocket up to $70,000. And that doesn't even include the legal bills that you may have uh, paid for. Mm -hmm. So this adds a new layer of censorship uh, because the Canadian Human Rights uh, Commission can receive even anonymous complaints. Uh, so you don't even know who's anonymous. accusing you. And, Did you say uh, anonymous, John? Anonymous. Wow. So they can be, that's in the discretion of the commission to anonymize or not. So you could have a situation where a guy in Vancouver uh, files a human rights complaint against a woman in Nova Scotia because she wrote something on the internet that was derogatory mm -hmm. about a mosque in Toronto. And even if the members of that mosque in Toronto are not offended by it, this guy in Vancouver can file a complaint against a woman in Nova Scotia mm -hmm. over what she said about the people in Toronto and you're off to the races and she, she could get prosecuted and, uh, you know, spend tens of thousands of dollars on legal bills and ultimately be out of pocket $70,000. Wow. And, and that's not criminal so, hate speech. That's just what, what the commission deems to be hateful. Okay. It's very subjective. But, but, but in the end, it is subjective, as you say, John. And example after example shows around the world that it's, you really can't define hate speech. It, it's, uh, it, it really devolves into the area of opinion, right? You you have a variety of people that can say all kinds of great things about other people and not so great things, silly things, even hateful things, or that seem to be things that show dislike or contempt. But does, is that sufficient enough to put them in jail for life? Is that the question? Well, the, the Supreme Court tries to distinguish now that currently the justice minister tries to explain it by saying, that uh, vilification, uh, promoting vilification and detestation is hate speech, but promoting disdain, dislike is not hate speech. And to mock and ridicule is not hate speech. To hurt somebody's feelings is not hate speech. But if you cross over this line, I, I have no idea where it is. Nobody will know where the line is. But you, if you cross over this line and get into detestation and vilification, well, now, now you're in trouble with the law. Well, can you explain the difference between uh, disdain, dislike, and detestation? It's it's just uh, it, oh. it's just a nightmare from a from a free speech standpoint, and right. we're we're better off just sticking with the the, the current criminal code uh, uh, prohibition on willful promotion of hatred was upheld by the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, fifteen no, tw twenty years ago, quite quite a while back. It was yeah. upheld as a valid restriction on free expression. So that's settled law. Uh, mm -hmm. But you, you take that any further and people are going to have to worry about what they say and then always looking over their shoulder. Oh, who's listening? You know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's terrifying. Well, it really is terrifying when you have someone who could come forward anonymously, initiate some kind of complaint among these kinds of half-cocked human rights commissions you could, they could bankrupt you. They could just shut you down entirely. And you don't have any room for healthy speech and engagement and differing opinion uh, as part of a society. Especially on, on important issues. I mean, I, I know your organization, you, you regularly, uh, you tackle, for example, Aboriginal issues, Aboriginal policy. Mm -hmm. And there's an example, uh, somebody can point their finger and, and say, well, you know, that's criminal hate speech. They probably won't do that because I don't I don't think you're likely to get charged under the criminal code. I'm familiar with some of the things that, that Frontier Center has, has written and published. Uh, but here's a perfect example. You're not likely to face criminal charges for willful promotion of hatred just because you point out the fact that, that there's no evidence that, that Aboriginal children were murdered in Kamloops. It may have happened, but there's no evidence to support that. So by making that claim, mm -hmm. you're you're not likely to face a criminal code, but you could face a human rights complaint that you know you're you're promoting uh, you're you're promoting hatred, uh, non-criminal, but you're promoting hatred towards Aboriginals by uh, disagreeing with the claim that Aboriginal children were murdered. That's an example, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And, uh, the, you know, the Gaza conflict, you've got a lot of strident, vociferous speech, uh, pro-Israel, anti-Israel, uh, pro-Hamas, anti-Hamas. There's a lot of strident comments being made, which is, which is as it should be. What do you expect? It's a war and people are dying. People have died. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not all of the speech is going to be perfectly reasonable and perfectly civil. And that's just par for the course. But there's an example. People are going to be filing human rights complaints left, right, and center against, uh, you know, pro-Israel or pro-Hamas speech or anti-Israel, anti-Hamas speech. Uh, they're going to say, oh, that's hate speech. File a complaint with the Human Rights Commission and we're off to the races. Here comes the prosecution. Exactly. The other term that is also um, uh, a huge flag is the term genocide. Um, certainly, historically, there's been um, well-defined uh, definitions around uh, a history of, of, of genocide that involves, um, uh, um, you know, the, the, the massacre, the destruction of large-scale numbers of, of a whole entire um, mass community. But now we're into a range where genocide is being redefined. It could mean really any type of offense, including cultural genocide. So is genocide another one of these flags where it's hard to define now in today as people try to redefine these words? Yes. Now, to my knowledge, the Online Harms Act is not proposing to redefine genocide as it's currently put in the criminal code. And I, I don't have it in front of me. I haven't... Uh, haven't read it recently, but it's it's outlined there that it, it's uh, you know the destruction in whole or in part of a, of an identifiable people group, words to that effect. So um, again, you would not face criminal charges for uh, researching and uh, publishing reports about hmm. Aboriginal issues, yeah. Aboriginal policy, uh, but it's a slippery slope. And I'm aware, and I think you're aware of of people that have publicly said that it should be criminal code offense to deny uh, the cultural genocide of aboriginals. And hmm. that's not in the Online Harms Act, right? But the, you can see there are people out there that rather than wanting to uh, engage in honest debate, uh, rather than loving truth, uh, which you do by refuting what is false, not jailing the person hmm. saying something that you think is false, um, th th those people, uh, they're the same as it's the same mentality as the online harms act. They want to punish speech that mm -hmm. they don't like. And if the online harms act is passed, the, the people that will be censored will be uh, conservatives and libertarians and social conservatives and religious people uh, and generally politically incorrect speech about Aboriginal issues or immigration. That's going to be well, the target. Well, I, I think frankly, it hits everybody. Every Canadian will be negatively impacted by this type of legislation because what it's doing is undermining the opportunity for healthy debate, the freedom of discussion, which has been integral to the pursuit of truth and the progress of our society. If you say that, no, you can talk about this, but you can't talk about that, then you're into that uh, dangerous zone where the king, the queen, the prime minister is pushing their agenda over the ability of people to find out what the truth is on a variety of issues. And that harms people, including the next generation, doesn't it, John? Well, absolutely. And the, the, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the protection for freedom of expression includes a right to listen. And there have been court rulings on this where it's not just the right of you and I and the other 40 million Canadians to speak. It's also the right of you and I and the other 40 million Canadians to listen to all manner, all kinds of viewpoints. And this is the problem. The attack on freedom of expression, what it amounts to is, is giving up our own freedom to decide for ourselves what is true or false, what is right or wrong, what is good or evil, what is hateful or loving. And instead of retaining that, that right to decide for ourselves, we're going to hand that over to something like the, the Digital Safety Commission uh, and the Human Rights Commission to decide on our behalf. And so wow. we're not going to hear the same diversity. There's a good word, diversity. I believe in diversity of speech. Intellectual diversity. And intellectual job. diversity. Yeah. And that's going to be harmed by the Online Harms Act. I, I'm very concerned, John, that Bill C... 6-3, the way it's been presented very much concerns me that they have 
essentially table two types of bills. One is about um, some kind of enhanced effort that really duplicates what's already there in law to protect children. And they're using this as cover to really introduce um, legislation that will destroy freedom of speech as we know it in this country. It will happen not just overnight, it will happen over time. And it will change really the fabric of our culture. So people, as they go about their day-to-day -day interactions, will always be second guessing, just like they did in East Germany so many years ago under the Stasi, the secret police who were endlessly monitoring each other for things that were ill thought out. It's almost like that, that movie with Tom Cruise, The Minority Report, for crimes, thought crimes, and for um, the anticipation of crimes that could happen, because that's all within the terms of this bill. Is that correct, John? The Online Harms Act, if passed in its current form, would add a new provision to the criminal code that makes it possible for a complainant to file a complaint with the provincial court and say, my next door neighbor, I believe, I fear that my next door neighbor is going to commit a speech crime. I fear that my next door neighbor is going to uh, willfully advocate for, for, for hatred or advocate for genocide and go to court and uh, your next door neighbor will have to appear. And the judge is going to make a ruling as to whether the complainant's fear is reasonable and if yes, the judge can then say to the accused person, okay, you haven't done anything wrong. You've done nothing illegal, but I'm going to place you under house arrest, curfew, ankle bracelet. Uh, you are to abstain from drugs and alcohol. We're going to require uh, blood or urine samples to confirm that you're abstaining from drugs and alcohol. We're going to put restrictions on where you can go, uh, put restrictions on who you can contact. And we're going to take away your legally owned, legally acquired firearms. Those are all conditions that the judge can place on a person who wow. has not committed any crime, but their next door neighbor fears that they might commit a crime in the future. If the person does not comply with those conditions or declares that they're not complying with those conditions, mm -hmm. uh, that person can spend up to two years in jail. And again, without having committed uh, a speech crime. This is in the bill. That is this, terrifying. This, so this, the bill was going to add that section to the criminal code, and it's going to amend the criminal code by increasing the maximum penalty uh, for adv advocating for genocide from five years to lifetime in jail. Unbelievable. So, John, in this context, if we can look at the, the bigger picture, um, you know, lawfare has been around for, for quite some time, but it's certainly at a different level here where you essentially use the law not to serve the people, but to use it for those in power as a weapon to place your your political opponents, people who disagree with you, in jail. Is that what's going on here? It won't always be jail, but the threat the threat of a human rights prosecution, uh, tens of thousands of dollars in legal bills, and ultimately up to seventy thousand dollars in in uh, fines and penalties payable. Uh, that that's a huge. It will be it, it will be used politically, I can guarantee it. Uh, we've seen this before when we had similar legislation, uh, not quite as bad, but uh, similar legislation was, was section 13 of the Canadian Human Rights Act. And uh, Ezra Levant and Mark Stein fought uh, long and hard and, and, and other people, uh, they took the brunt of it, those two. They were both prosecuted, as you mentioned earlier, under the human rights legislation. So, um, this uh, it, 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 it gets political, right? So if if you're uh, if you want to push this agenda, we're trying to fight uh, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, Islamophobia. Uh, mm. So somebody says something that you think is racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, Islamophobic. Well, uh, human rights complaints can be filed cheaply and easily, and if they're dismissed mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it doesn't cost the complainant anything other than the uh, you know, five minutes or, or 35 minutes it took to, uh, to slap the complaint together. Unbelievable. So we're entering into a new era, potentially, with these kinds of laws. And it, it, to me, it, it's, it's very disturbing because one of the strengths of Canada is we've had a, 
Um, people come from many different lands and traditions, including of faith backgrounds, people who are of Christian background, um, Aboriginal uh, perspectives on, on larger uh, perspectives on life. You've got people that are Muslim, all kinds of faiths. And people will, in their effort to be um, faithful, will advocate strong opinions about all kinds of issues. But it doesn't mean that they don't live in unity and peacefully in a tolerant way. But this, this potentially upsets all of that. I think of legislation like another uh, uh, part of legislation, like what is it called? C367. Oh, yeah, we can talk about that. That will, affect, will effectively have a huge impact then on the public square and what you can say in terms of even citing uh, scripture. Is that right, John? Yeah, Bill, Bill um, C-367 put forward by the, the leader of the mm -hmm. Bloc Québécois, it would, if passed, it removes a defense that is currently in the Criminal Code Section 319, uh, Willful Promotion of Hatred. Now, the defenses are outlined there. One of them is the defense of truth, which we talked about previously. Mm -hmm. uh, another one is uh, fair comment and a comment on, on a topic of, of, of public interest. Another one is uh, another defense that is available is the uh, citation of of uh, religious text or uh, expounding on a religious text uh, or sincere sincerely expressed opinion based on a religious text. So I'll give you a very graphic example uh, in the Bible in the book of Leviticus. There is a passage there that says, and this is not a perfect quote. I'm paraphrasing, but uh, a man shall mm. not lie with another man. Uh, as you would with a woman, and uh, if a man engages in that conduct, uh, he should be put to death. Now, I'm not mm -hmm. aware of any Christians or Orthodox Jews who, uh, you know, believe that 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 we should be applying that literally. However, uh, that passage, or citing that passage, or uh, presenting a teaching on that passage, uh, it could you could be charged with hate speech. Now, currently. If you were charged with hate speech uh, for, you know, preaching against uh, sexual behavior that is contrary to, you know, whether it's uh, Islam, Orthodox Judaism, Christianity, if you were charged with hate speech, you could avail yourself of that defense and you could say, well, uh, I'm quoting from a religious text that says that uh, gay sex is sinful. And so you would have a defense. And because you have that defense, you probably wouldn't get charged in the first place because Crown prosecutors are bound to uh, prosecute only cases where there is a reasonable likelihood of conviction. So this is a defense uh, for religious speech. Okay, so Bill, Bill C-367, if passed, would remove that defense from the criminal code, and now you'd be in a, in a position where uh, Orthodox rabbis and uh, imams at mosques and uh, Catholic priests, uh, uh, Protestant and evangelical ministers, hmm. could be charged with hate speech, if they preach against homosexuality and they would not have the defense and because they would not have the defense, it's more likely they, that they would be charged because now the crown could look at it and say, well, we've got a reasonable likelihood of conviction. Exactly. The other cases that come to my mind and there's so many of them. Um, and you're very familiar with the case of Amy Ham because you're the justice center is providing uh, legal support for her case. Can you tell us more about what you think are the impacts of this kind of legislation on, on a case like Amy Ham? I, I don't think that the online harms act would have an impact specifically on, on a professional, uh, nurse, doctor, psychologist, lawyer, teacher, engineer, um, There'll be a general impact on on every teacher, every psychologist, every doctor, every engineer, every lawyer, uh, by by the Human Rights Commission having new powers to prosecute non criminal hate speech. Amy Ham was disciplined by the British Columbia College of Nurses and Midwives because she dared to say in public that uh, brace yourself, there are only two genders. And women deserve to have uh, safe female-only spaces, such as washrooms, change rooms, locker rooms, uh, women's prisons, uh, rape crisis centers, uh, female-only sporting competitions. So Amy Ham has said publicly there are only two genders and women are entitled to have a safe space. And for this, she was prosecuted by the BC College of Nurses and Midwives. And wow. uh, we're just, we've just concluded the final stage of 
hearings have gone on. The prosecution has gone on for more than three years. And so the three Justice Center years. started in September of 2020. And now we're in, in uh, March of 2024. So it's been uh, three and a half years. And the Justice Center has been providing lawyers uh, to, for, for Amy Hamm. So back to your question, it, the attacks on free speech uh, by the professional bodies like Law Society, College, college of uh, Physicians and Surgeons, uh, Teachers College, uh, they're not going to be directly impacted by the Online Harms Act, although they'll certainly be encouraged to, uh, to censor professionals. Mm -hmm. But, but John, I think ironically, that's the point. This is all part of the pattern uh, again and again of laws being introduced, actions being undertaken by, by quote, professional associations that should know better or all kinds of legislators who are empowering, I would call them thugs, bullies, authoritarians who want to go around and beat people up just because they don't agree with them just because they have a different perspective. Now, I get it. We don't want to be hateful in this society. But part of the reality is we need desperately in this society more than ever healthy debate and discussion. That's the process by which we get to truth and that our society can move forward. And we do that with grace and tolerance. But as soon as you start introducing lifelong prison sentences, fines to boot, and a grinding down of process that will take years then we have arrived in 1984, John. Can't disagree with you. The other, uh, the other aspect we hadn't touched on yet is that the Online Harms Act gives the federal cabinet new powers to censor social media services. They can create all kinds of regulations. And uh, th th those censorship regulations will, be, uh, will acquire the force of law without any input from parliament. And this is this is what regulations are all about. The the federal cabinet, or you know, provincial regulations for, uh, under a provincial law, and then we're going to establish the uh, the the um, digital safety commission. Watch out when people use that word safety. We have to remember that during the French Revolution, it was the Committee for Public Safety that chopped oh. off the heads of thousands of people. Yeah. So be careful. Double speak. It's what, all double speak, right, John? Digital Safety Commission. Well, it 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 uh, there's no there's no safe space for free speech. Uh, if these people, who yeah. uh, the wow. the bill the bill actually says they're not bound by the rules of evidence, mm -hmm. so you're going to have some very very arrogant bureaucrats. Yeah, uh, that are but not constrained always... by the rule of law that that will enforce these new censorship regulations that will be passed by the federal cabinet. Exactly, and this is always the lesson of history, isn't it, John? That the people left these czars, the good and the great, get appointed. And they are the ones, they're the ones because they're so wise that will determine exactly what hate is, what genocide is, what anything they say is according to them. So this is uh, a huge red flag. And, and so I have a question to you, because John, how many years have you been practicing law? I was called to the bar in 1999. So yeah, go, go 20, uh, I guess uh, t about 24 years. <laughs> so 10 years ago, would you have ever anticipated in your legal career that such a piece of legislation could be introduced at this time? I would have anticipated that a uh, government with a different philosophy, the, the Section 13 of the Canadian Human Rights Act, uh, which you know allowed the, the Human Rights Commission to prosecute non-criminal hate speech, um, it was repealed under the Harper government. Uh, I would not have been surprised if there if there was a bill put forward that said, "Okay, we're going to bring back Section 13 back to the way it was before." That that would have disappointed me, but it would not have surprised me. But here we've got preemptive punishment uh, of of people who have not committed any crime. We've got life in prison for advocating genocide. We've got uh, you know anonymous complaints under the Human Rights Commission. Uh, we've got federal cabinet with new powers to censor social media services. We've got a new digital safety commission. All of the other stuff, uh, I, I couldn't. It would have surprised me ten years ago. It's still shocking today. And and you alluded to this. It's always a free speech for me, but not for thee. Because if you ask any exactly. supporter, um, yeah, I, I, 
if you were to have a supporter of the, the Online Harms Act, I'd be surprised if somebody comes forward to uh, chat with you about it. But if you could find somebody, uh, if you ask that person, well, you know, how do you feel about uh, other people curtailing your speech if they disagree with it, find it offensive, find mm-hmm. it hurtful? And that person would probably say, oh, no, no, you know, I should be allowed free speech, uh, mm-hmm. right? So it's, it's free speech for me, but not for the is the underlying exactly. uh, philosophy behind the censorship. Well, I, I, I think one of the things I find so inherently bad about this legislation is not only its content um, and its implications on the right of freedom of speech, but also what I find so offensive is the use of the front part of this bill around online harms as cover, manipulating our care and compassion for children and those poor parents where there's been children that say have been victimized and using them as cover for political manipulation really of the real significant part of the bill, which is really about going after freedom of speech. So I think this is really, that says it all, doesn't it, John, that a government would use others, including the the cause of children as really cover for a pretty uh, cynical use of lawfare. It's a very clever marketing strategy. And this is another uh, issue in in relation to the bill is that, you know, of course, uh, it's right uh, that we have criminal code prohibitions on, uh, you know, posting an intimate image of somebody without their consent and revenge Mm -hmm. porn and uh, so on, you know, child pornography. Uh, All of this stuff is, is, is criminal. And the, the big thing though, is that the, the first line of defense to protect children from online harms is parents and children are not going to be harmed online if their parents are closely, carefully Mm -hmm. monitoring, uh, not just the amount of time that kids spend looking at their, Mm -hmm. their smartphones or iPhones or computer screens, but also, uh, monitoring what are their kids looking at, uh, you get a lot more online if if parents are are getting are giving their kids uh, you know free reign to uh, sur- surf the internet for whatever they want, um, and giving their kids free reign to get into uh, so- yeah. so- social media, um, then that's that's the first line of of defense. And and again, I support yeah. criminalizing uh, the things that are already criminal. I think they should stay in the criminal code and. The criminal code should be a backup. It's really up to parents. And on, mm-hmm. on this point, our justice minister, uh, Arif Virani, he said, it was interesting. This was at the news conference uh, where he's got all these parents behind him, you know, big, big crowd mm-hmm. of people. And he says, you know, there, there are safety regulations for the Lego that my kids play with. And so therefore we also need uh, safety regulations for uh, the biggest toy in every home, which is the internet. And they go, wait a minute. Wow. No, no. It's parents that ought to be monitoring, controlling mm-hmm. uh, what their kids see. Yeah. Uh, you don't what, let your children just play it on the street, do you? No. And, but, but then, th- then there's this false notion that, oh, you know, so we need, we need the government to protect the children. Well, actually, no, mm-hmm. we need parents to protect their own children. And, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, many parents are doing a fantastic job and, Presumably, some parents are, are not doing mm-hmm. a good job of that, but that, that's that's a, a very uh, a direct and very effective way to protect children from online harm is for parents to step up to the plate and assume their responsibilities to protect mm-hmm. their children. Exactly. Yeah. So that's part of the dynamic here, where we want to elevate the level of public policy and the level of, you know, the. The, the conduct around the process around public policy so that we're not always just simply cynically using a public policy as a weapon against your political opponent. Um, so in this case, I guess my question to you, John, would be, is there something deeper going on here? We know that through the last several years, law has been changing. We have a tradition in our uh, Western Anglo Uh, Saxon societies, including Canada, of emphasizing the uh, precedent, the common law. And certainly Magna Carta was was in many respects uh, a seminal moment in in the beginning of of common law that kind of embedded in the DNA of the law 
um, a respect for precedence and how we would go together and make decisions as a society. And, and that had a huge bearing on our culture and our, our sense of freedom and working together to build a better society. And it's worked very well. But it seems like the last several years, we've had a different change of the law that's been happening. One that emphasizes um, a, a, a kind of a, an authoritarianism uh, in an effort to achieve, quote, social justice and equal outcomes. And I'm wondering if something else is happening with the law where we have a raging debate beneath the surface that this, this type of legislation represents the, the emergence, really, of Marxist law. Is that, is that, a, is that a, a good insight here, John? Well, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, we're always, there, there's always, um, well, maybe not always, but certainly in the past few centuries in, in, uh, in countries around the world, there is a, uh, an ongoing war, not necessarily a war with bullets and tanks and, and, and bombs, but uh, mm -hmm. kind of a, a culture war uh, of those who are collectivists and authoritarians, and they want a powerful government that's going to tell citizens what to think and what to do and how to behave and present the citizens with some big project, big goal, and everybody has to get on board with the project. Uh, and then there's those of us that believe in limited government and the rule of law and the individual freedoms of, of conscience, religion, expression, association, peaceful mm -hmm. assembly. And so um, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, when you look, we're, we're back uh, full circle to 100 years ago. In the 1920s in Europe, uh, 1920s, 1930s, there were fascist movements in Europe in just about every country in Europe. Uh, some of them were successful. You know, they took power in uh, Germany and Italy and Spain, Hungary, uh, Croatia during the war, and uh, some other countries. Uh, but but even, even in countries where the fascists did not take power, they had fascist movements, fascist political parties. Uh, the Netherlands, hmm. which is where I was born, they had a fascist party that hmm. uh, in one election got 8% of Indeed. the vote. Uh, you know, Norwegian fascists, uh, French fascists, now, these mm -hmm. were people, they didn't like the free society. And this is what we have to wrap our heads around, is that it'd be naive and foolish and, and, and wrong to assume that everybody supports uh, our democratic rights and freedoms and, and, and a free country. Mm -hmm. um, many people do not. They, they very much do not want uh, to have limited government and uh, maximum in individual freedom. So we've come full circle. Now, today's fascists, uh, they don't have the same goals. They're not talking about, uh, you know, a Canadian mm -hmm. master race and uh, conquering our neighbors. And, you know, the, the external objective is different. Like now we have woke fascism where everybody has mm -hmm. to be coerced into this uh, national mission of stamping out racism, sexism, homophobia, Islamophobia, transphobia. Mm -hmm. And so it's woke fascism. The, the outside coding, it's, it's a different color, but on the inside, it's the same fascism that we saw a hundred years ago. Wow. No, I think that's a real challenge. And, you know, or and Marxism, Marxism would be, it'd be a similar example, right? The Marxists, mm -hmm. uh, and of course there's, you know, obvious differences between Marxism and fascism, but they have mm -hmm. a similarity. The Marxists will say, uh, we all have to get on board with the program and join in uh, the great mission to create the workers' paradise and to create this uh, equality of outcome. And the state is going to coerce everybody into producing this, this equal society. And so the goal is different. Uh, the goal is, you know, workers' paradise, uh, substantive equality. But mm. the methods are the same. And the methods mean to destroy our freedom of, freedoms of expression. And, and other freedoms. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, this is the certainly the pattern in history as as people, these these authoritarians work together to create their utopia here on Earth. And, um, and uh, individual rights and freedom should be put aside as they build a better utopia for all of us, supposedly. So on that note, I did want to share with you a fascinating clip. Um, that is not being seen by many people. It's actually by the Minister of Justice, who's talking about an extraordinary legal toolkit, as I understand, that the government of Canada sponsored and is sharing 
with different countries internationally. And I wanted to share this clip with us. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's a great honor to share a few words with you at the launch of the toolkit on mainstreaming gender and human rights in the implementation of the UN Convention Against Transitional Organized Crime. It's a great honor for me to share a few words with you at the launch of the toolkit on the mainstreaming gender and human rights in the implementation of the UN Convention Against Transitional Organized Crime. It's a great honor for me to share a few words with you at the launch of the toolkit on the mainstreaming gender and human rights in the implementation I would also like to thank the United Kingdom and the UN ODC for supporting this General Assembly side event. The integration of human rights, gender inclusivity, and intersectionality in policymaking is a priority for Canada. It's also a priority for me personally. Prior to my appointment as Minister of Justice, I spent my legal career advocating for equality and the protection and promotion of human rights. This includes time spent as a UN prosecutor. Our government strives to apply gender-based analysis plus, or GBA plus, an analytical approach that provides a rigorous method for the assessment of systemic inequalities. It's also a way to assess how diverse groups of people may experience initiatives, including those on organized crime. At Canada's Department of Justice, for example, my officials apply a GBA plus lens to all of our work, from legal services, policy and program development, to communications and evaluation. This helps to ensure that all initiatives are responsive, inclusive, and reflective of diverse experiences and realities in order to more effectively prevent and combat crime. Their work is supported by a departmental GBA plus unit with expertise in gender mainstreaming. We must consider the needs of all people. Canada is very pleased to fund the UN ODC toolkit through our anti-crime capacity building program. We see its development and launch as a very important step. The toolkit will provide resources to help support and champion gender and human rights mainstreaming efforts in the implementation of the Transit National Organized Crime Convention and integrate recommendations and best practices shared by many countries on this issue in recent years across various United Nations fora. Our financial contribution is just one part of Canada's support to this initiative. It builds on our recognition that it is essential to integrate intersectional and gender-based analysis and to incorporate human rights considerations into all anti-crime efforts. We do this not only to adhere to relevant international treaties and customary legal norms, but also to protect marginalized and at-risk persons from harm. We want to prevent re-victimization and re-traumatization. These efforts help ensure that no one is left behind in Canada and around the world. I commend the work undertaken by the UN ODC in the development of this toolkit, and I encourage all governments and practitioners to use it as we all work to prevent and counter organized crime. Je salue le travail entrepris par le ON UDC dans l'élaboration de cette boîte à outils, et j'encourage tous les gouvernements et practitioners à l'utiliser dans le cadre de leur effort de prévention et de lutte contre la criminalité organisée. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. You can see that that clip is actually quite a fascinating window. Um, I mean, there's, there's certainly language that may be confusing for many people, but this is classic um, Marxist analysis um, being employed and embedded across the use of the law from prosecution, certainly on the criminal side, uh, to many other things. So you want, I would encourage people to look actually at this toolkit. You can actually find it online. But I think this is a stunning example where our Minister of Justice is, um, I would argue, in my opinion, taking a radically different view of the law and the integration of these so-called Marxist diversity, equity, and inclusion lens in its application, John. Is that not a fair insight here? No, I agree with you, Dave. Yeah, for the record, I'm in favor of diversity, and I'm in favor of inclusion. I'm in favor of equity. Uh, Indeed. But, but these, uh, this is problematic when, uh, if I was to you know, sit down for coffee with uh, Justice Minister Arif and if we were to drill down a little bit as to what we mean by those words, uh, we would be poles apart. So on, on a superficial level, uh, I, I'm mm -hmm. all in favor of equity, diversity, inclusion, all three of them. Um, but what he means when he says gender-based analysis, uh, you know, there are different kinds of feminism. There's a, what you might call a classical feminism or traditional feminism, which says that mm -hmm. men and women are equal and there's no reason why a woman uh, could not become, mm. uh, you know, pr prime minister, uh, policeman, firefighter, doctor, lawyer, sure. uh, CEO of the corporation, 
uh, so men and women should have equal rights. Okay, fine, that's one kind of feminism. There's a different kind of feminism that sees men as 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 evil and women are good, and that uh, that there's this systemic oppression and it's against the whole notion that that all of us, whether male or female, have to assume responsibility for our own choices and that both men and women are equally capable of doing good and doing evil. So th- th- those are very different definitions of feminism. And so that gender-based analysis, uh, I doubt, I don't know for sure, but I, I don't think it's the kind of uh, you know classical feminism or traditional feminism that, that I myself no, subscribe to. All. And the same with the other words. He talks about, he talks about human rights. Well, I've, I fight for human rights every day. Uh, and I've, I've got, mm-hmm. you know, Justice Center's got a, a team of lawyers and, and paralegals that, that are uh, fighting across the country for human rights. Uh, but, you know, my, my understanding of human rights is that, that it includes uh, our freedom to, to speak and to practice our faith. And I think uh, Justice Minister Arif's idea of human rights uh, is quite different from mine. I agree. And I would dare say that the, the minister is really forfeiting his duty and responsibility to uphold the rule of law in our common law tradition. And, and this is where, um, our frankly, our country needs a national debate on what kind of society, what kind of nation we want to build. A nation based on the rule of law or a nation of laws uh, created by, I would argue, authoritarian leaders who who seek to impose their political will, their way of thinking, and to deem some people with acceptable versus unacceptable thoughts. Well, we go back, you know, we're we're in the same battle as 90 years ago, 100 years ago, and a lot of it depends on what Canadians of goodwill do in terms of, of being active in the democratic process. Uh, because when you so most countries in Europe had a fascist political party or a fascist movement, in some countries the fascists won, in other countries the fascists did not win, That's and it's the same. Indeed. You know, on 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 that point, I, w- I want to mention we've we've got a the Justice Center has a petition. We are currently just shy of fifty thousand signatures. We're hoping to uh, well get done. another fifty thousand in in the next few weeks, and these are going to be delivered to the Prime Minister's office in Ottawa in April. And uh, I strongly urge uh, anybody listening to the podcast or seeing the video, contact your member of parliament. And I don't care what party he or she belongs to, the MPs have to hear phone calls and emails from their constituents and silence is consent. Mm -hmm. If you don't contact your MP, uh, you know, if somebody accuses you of of not stopping the Online Harms Act, uh, that accusation might hold some water. Well said, and I I really commend the Centre for developing that petition. I know other groups as well are trying to pursue forms of action. It's important then, isn't it, John, that Canadians as citizens speak up um, and and be sure to contact their elected representatives, particularly if they're from other parties that are in support of this uh, nonsense. But this is a very historic time in the life of our nation, is it, John? Every day, every month, every year, they're, they're all important uh, because when, when we lose our rights and freedoms uh, and we've been you know, heading in the wrong direction for, for decades now, it, it typically does not happen overnight. Uh, it's bit by bit by bit. So we've seen previously, we, we've had bills uh, C-11 and C-18 uh, that give uh, government more control over the internet. And uh, those were uh, very bad steps, but they were small. Uh, their impact uh, in some cases is not felt immediately. This Online Harms Act is a quantum leap. It's not just a step in the wrong direction. It's it's a jump. It's a leap in the wrong direction. But um, it, it's, really, it's really up to us as citizens to, uh, if, if people who love freedom roll up their sleeves and become more active in the democratic process, uh, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing, as the old saying goes. And so I think we can stop the Online Harms Act if there are enough Canadians that voice their concerns mm-hmm. about it. Uh, or if we don't stop it entirely, uh, maybe we can get some of the worst provisions eliminated from it. Mm-hmm. Indeed. So 
I want to thank you very much, John, for all your work and leadership on this important issue, and uh, as well as your ongoing uh, comments today that help us understand uh, the importance of us speaking up as citizens for individual rights and freedoms. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on your show, David. Thank you for watching Leaders on the Frontier. We're a nonpartisan think tank. We explore ideas, policy, and practical solutions that can make a difference in the lives of Canadians. We do not accept any government funding. We work for you. Thank you for supporting Frontier. Visit fcpp.org to give. While you're there, be sure to check out our latest articles and research. Without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking, nor are you free. Comment below. We'd love for you to join the conversation.